in the, the south of India and in Kerala. And we train social change makers from around the world so that they can start their own organizations and run them effectively. And we have a, we have a slightly different approach than the usual leadership training programs uh, as we look at a change from within approach. <clears throat> so we work with people that have overcome uh, or survived some kind of adversity. And because of that, they're very driven to start and run their own social ventures. And in the last 11 or 13 years, we trained uh, 258 change makers from 53 different countries. And they started more than 160 organizations uh, creating an impact from within. I'll come back to that later. First, I would like to take you on a little journey. And uh, every good story starts with once upon a time. So this is goes long, by, long back, <laughs> 1997. So some of you uh, must have been very young at the time, I guess. And uh, I was traveling and I traveled all the way to Tibet. And the first person I met was a young lady from Germany. I asked her if she was there to, for sightseeing. And she said, nope. And she said it so with so much fierce. I was wondering uh, why that was. And well, it was, her name is Sabria and Sabria is blind. So there's not much of sightseeing going on, right? <laughs> so Sabria told me her life story. Luckily she had a good sense of humor. She didn't beat me up. And Sabria became blind at a young age. <clears throat> she was bullied. And she was uh, she she left school at some point, and uh, it's a long story, but I'll keep it very short. So Sabria was uh, she went to a special school for the blind. She got empowered, and then she went to an exhibition about Tibet, and then she said, "That's what I want to study." And then they said, "Well, that's not possible. You're blind. That's not going to work." And then Sabria did it anyway, and then she created the Tibetan Braille script for her own use, and this was seen by a Tibetan scholar. And he took it to Tibet and he asked, "Who can come and teach?" And they said, Sabria can come. So Sabria went on horseback alone uh, through Tibet in 1997. That's where I met her. Now, on this journey, and, and now we come to the point where we would like to where I have a question for all of you. On this journey, she met a young, she met lots of blind children. They were locked away in dark rooms and they were left there to die. Because people in Tibet believe that blind people have done something wrong in their previous life or they have, uh, they have been possessed by uh, demons and nobody wants to uh, you know, touch them. And that was very shocking for Sabrina. And so she said, what difference can I make here? And luckily she met one boy and his name was Tenzin. And Tenzin <coughs> smiled and he said, oh, you're blind, I'm blind too. And he said with so much conviction that um, it was, so Sabrina was wondering how come that this boy has so much confidence? Now, here it comes, it's a very simple thing, a very simple sum of, of results. It's, uh, he was the yak herder in the village, so he had a task. You have a task, you have value. If you have value, you are respected. If you're respected, you get dignity. And only if there's dignity, then self-confidence can come. Now, a lot of people, they never made it to dignity and that's not necessarily their fault. It's pressure from surrounding, from parents, brothers, sisters, society at large. There's a huge pressure, especially in India, on women because they have to get a good education before before they're 25, get married before they're 25, have kids before they're 30, and otherwise they're being you know, looked up and, and sidelined, basically. So now the, the big challenge was Sabrina knew what to do. She said at that time, I know now that we have to start a space where we can bring these blind children together. They gain skills, they learn, they get this you know, self-confidence and true self-confidence because they first get their dignity. And then with this new one self-confidence, they go back into regular schools and they integrate themselves into these schools. That was the idea that Sabria had at that time. And then she, so Sabria went back to Germany, raised funds. Um, and one year later, she called me up. I said, call me up, we do this together. So she called me up and she said, next week I'm going back to Tibet. And then I said, um, I didn't say anything. And Sabria got a little angry. She said, we don't know each other that well. At least you can wish me luck, don't cry. <laughs> so I said, you know what, I'll, I'll join you. So the next day I quit my job, best decision I've ever made. And we flew back to Tibet. That's where we big, big had big, big troubles because we had these blind kids coming literally from dark rooms. And what could we do to give them hope? Life is what you're happy getting up for. It's very simple. Life's what you're happy getting up for. So we came with a solution and the solution is very simple. Um, most important question in life is what? And I would like to ask one of you just to answer that question. What's the most important question in life? Anyone? Don't be shy. <laughs> Anyone? Yes. Just shout. <laughs> Perfect. 
No one? Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll give it away. It's, I think, in my opinion, there, is what do I... Yes, please? There are two, two responses on the chat. <coughs> love. The chat. Oh, okay. okay, love. Who, who am, am I? I? Why, why, do why do you exist? Uh -huh. Okay, how can I be an instrument of peace? Okay, so they, these all come very close. I think the most important question to answer for a person is, what do I want? See, there's a very simple saying. It says, if I ask people what they do, usually there's two answers. I have to go to school. I have to go to work. And they're both terrible because it's forced by an external force, it seems. So what do I want? So if I have to, changes to I want to. That's where the magic begins. And that's what change from within is all about, right? It starts with you, right? If the inner drive, the, if, if, it's, if you have an intrinsic motivation to get something done, it will get done, right? So we started this, this dream factory. Very simple solution. We asked our students, our blind little kids, we asked them, what is it that you want? Don't think if you can or cannot do it, we'll solve that later. What is it that you want in life, right? So we gave them two weeks time. And here's Nobu, eight years old, he smiles, he says, I want to become a taxi driver. <laughs> so, of course, immediately people would say, like, you stupid little kid, you're blind, you cannot see, that's not going to work. Right? Now, we said, wonderful. Can you imagine if we would be in a world where everybody would believe in each other's dreams and encourage that? We definitely would not be in the shit we're in now. <laughs> right? So we said, wonderful. Nobody has the right to destroy anybody's dreams. So we said, wonderful. Two years later, Nobu is 10. He speaks English, Tibetan, Chinese. He walks with a white cane through the streets of Lhasa. He serves in the internet. And we had a new group of students coming in. And we had a new dream factory. And we asked him, what about your dream, Nobu? What's the status? And he said, well, now I realize the fact that I can't see. Maybe it's not so safe to become a taxi driver. But I can set up a taxi company and run it. He's 10 years old. He never did that. Two years after that, he became interested in making cheese. And I'm from the Netherlands, so uh, and the cheese in Tibet is not all that tasty. So we were very happy when he said that. So he was the first blind person ever to fly. And he flew all the way to the Netherlands, learned how to make cheese, came back and started a cheese factory. That's more than 20 years ago. And nowadays he runs a restaurant and a medical massage clinic. And he is successful and happy. Why? Because he does what he wants. Now, now I have a question for all of you. And that is, and I ask this question every week when we get guests coming to our campus and we give some talks. How much time in your life have you thought about, dedicated time, what you really want to do? Dedicated time, 1% of your lifetime, right? 5%, 10%. <laughs> and what is the answer, right? Even if you have spent 50% on it, I think nobody has. But <laughs> so usually when I ask the groups that come here, there's usually architect students or social workers uh, students. Uh, most of them, they don't come to 1% of their lifetime. And if it's the most important question, why don't we spend more time on that? So now I would like to open up and ask you guys, what is it that you burn for? Or what is it that you want to do? And that you get up for, well, happy every morning, right? Life is what you're happy getting up for. What do you get up for? <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> well, I think I can go. And hello, and by the you? way. <laughs> uh, <yeah>. I am your <laughs> So as Paul was talking about, oh. I'm, I'm part of Kanthari. I think he will talk about that. So for me, I think uh, working for environment is something, um, yeah, that gives me a sense of meaning or that's what I would like to work on, yeah. When did you find that out? Uh, I think in my mid twenties, right now I'm 33. So yeah, I'm 24, 25. Yeah. Well, that's great that you found it out already, right? <laughs> Yeah, I think I, I had a direction and then Kantari helped me to kind of reach closer to wh what I wanted to do. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Anyone else? You don't have to be a Kantari to react here. No? That's it. <laughs> No. <laughs> I, I can go. 
Yes, please. I, I uh, wanted to Alice. create. Hi. <laughs> I wanted to create a shift in education. Very good. And and uh, what what made you uh, brought you to that point? <laughs> um, I had not a very good uh, high school experience. <laughs> yeah. Can can you share a little bit about that? What was not good about it? Was it like teachers not treating you well, or? Yeah, it was just uh, very boring and uh, detaching, and it was a waste of time. And uh, when I found creative ways to, you know, jump through the hoops. Um, for, so, for example, uh, one class was very, very boring and I wasn't learning anything. So I just would go when there was tests or assignments due. <clears throat> and that this was a very long time ago. <laughs> and uh, uh, the instructor um, then uh, took a half a mark off for every day that I was not there. So oh. <laughs> my 85 became, a, you know, 45 and I didn't get the credit and I actually didn't graduate from high school. <clears throat> but now okay. I have That's... a PhD. <laughs> Excellent. Why do you look happy? <laughs> so any, anyone else, what is it? What is it that you, you know, what we can wake you up for in the middle of the night, you wouldn't get angry, you'd be happy. <laughs> Yes, Devin. I've um, for a really long time wanted to like create or join some kind of team to help change the world. And um, when I was a teenager, I was um, in a manic episode, uh, I was diagnosed bipolar disorder, and it was a very fantastical mm -hmm. version. I was, um, you know, going to create like a real superhero team. It was going to be like a book or a movie or a video game. I had it all planned out and and uh, everyone thought I was crazy, and there was, and I was, I think, <laughs> but I was responding to something that a lot of people were accepting, which is the world is full of so many problems, and most people were saying, "Well, this is the way it is," and I was saying, "No, this is this is wrong. There's so many things we have to change." <laughs> and so, more recently, yeah. since the pandemic, I've come back to this idea: like, I really want to help have a bigger impact. Like, I know people say, "Just start where you are, start with yourself," and I I believe in that, but I I've been slowly reaching out, emailing, finding, looking online and sort of going against the grain. A lot of people tell me, you know, you have to give up this stuff. You have to just focus on your own classroom, your own thing. And, and I kept, something kept pushing me against the grain of, of what other people tell me. And it finally brought me to this conference. I'm very grateful to be here. Nice. That's nice. Yeah. It's, it's all, but it's, it's first you think, what is it that you want, right? It's the basic question. It comes back to that. And, it's, I think that's what a lot of people spend too little time on. So we have a we have an exercise at Cantari when people start when we it's about time management. See, there's no equality in the world, and I think unfortunately we won't you know see that coming soon that there will be an equal world or equality in the world. But there's two things that are the same for every living being. There are only two things: 24 hours a day and death. <laughs> now, knowing these two factors, why isn't it um, you know why are not more people running frantically around to see how they can spend those 24 hours a day in the best way every day. <laughs> that's something is, uh, I, I think that's, that's what I'm, I'm worried about. And I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit sad because we are a species that have such an enormous, um, how to say, capacity of doing good. And as we are speaking right now, there is hundreds of thousands of people that are in factories making weapons. And that's not bad as it is, you know, bad enough as it is. What is worse is that these weapons are being used. But what is even worse is that there's hundreds of thousands of people going into factories tomorrow to try to make better weapons. We're idiots as, as humans, right? We, we can do so much better. And so I, I, I might want to, uh, so that the ecoversity that we started basically is we looked at the history and we said, okay, where was change sustainable? And we very quickly understood that change was not sustainable when it was coming in from outside, when it was the I have to. And especially when, if I look at my forefathers, uh, the Dutch, they've been traveling quite a bit. And they went through, you know, so-called developing countries and they would tell what was right and wrong in these spaces. And they tried to make a whole difference. And that's the first thing that we did when we came to India. We said, we're not here to change India. <laughs> if it wants to change, 
that has to be done by the Indians, right? That's, that's, that's their thing. We are outsiders. We won't be able to do that. So Sabri has a wonderful analogy to that. So she's standing with a, so there's a blind woman, she's standing with a white cane on the side of the street. She's waiting for a friend. Now here comes the helper, right? And sees this blind woman standing there, thinks, ah, she has to cross the street. So without asking, grabs her here, carries her halfway across, you know, halfway across the and notices that she's being moved across. And then she says, oh, what's happening? And then the helper says, well, I'm helping you. You are crossing, I'm helping you to cross the street. And then Sabria said, well, actually, I wasn't wanting to go across the street. I was waiting for a friend. And then suddenly the hand lets go, um, angry. <laughs> I was helping. You're not very grateful now, are you? <laughs> and then Sabria is standing in the middle of the street in more danger than she was before she was being helped. <laughs> that's a traditional help uh, factor. So now we, we looked at it a different way. We said when change came from within, that's where it's very powerful. So what we do at Kantari is, so Kantari first might give you the name, it's a, the name of a very spi spicy chili, extremely spicy chili. And if you bite on it, you go, it's, it wakes you up, it, it uh, makes you awake better than coffee can. It's, uh, it's healthy for you, it lowers your blood pressure. It's, it's really an amazing little chili. And so for us, it was a perfect symbol for a change maker. So Kantari Gandhi or Kantari Mandela or any one of the change makers say uh, a name after a spicy chili. Now at Kantari, we look at uh, people that uh, we work with people that have seen pretty dark sides of humanity. So we have people with albinism from East Africa and they are being killed and chopped up in pieces and their body parts are sold as good luck charms. The hand goes for $75,000 these days. And so we had Jane Waitera, she came in 2009, and she went back and she started positive exposure. So she's fighting against these killings and for the rights of people with albinism. Now, the advantage is that she's a person with albinism. So she can go back and say, we. Well, she goes back to her own community. She speaks the language, the culture. She knows the, you know, the cultural background, the, the historical background, the context, right? That is something that an outsider can never do. So there's immediate link between, you know, her and her target group because she's part of that target group. We have uh, in India, we have, for example, um, Jochna Das. And Jochna was beaten up by her husband for several years. And one day she said, This is it. So she got her kids to, the, uh, to her sister. She went into the fields and she found a well that was 30 meters deep. She looked around and she jumped. And she was double lucky as there was enough water in the well to break her fall, but not enough to drown. And the double luck came that Gauri Shankar, a child activist, he saw her jump and saved her life. Now, this is many years ago. Georgina came here and she uh, now has trained more than 4,000 women in you know, making little products that they become less uh, financially dependent on their husbands. And it's really women empowerment. So they have these groups. And when one woman doesn't show up in the morning, um, they know that probably something happened. So there's seven women with baseball bats. They go and pay a visit. And they're going to tell the husband uh, next, you know, one more time this and we're going to beat you up because the police is not doing anything uh, against that. So we have ex-child soldiers from Liberia, Sierra Leone, and they are now, um, they, they are now training ex-child soldiers in skills other than killing people to make a living. Uh, we have people that work on the environment. We have people with disability. We have AIDS orphans. Uh, we have ex-street uh, children. It's a, it's a big mix of people. And the, they go back and this is this is the nicest thing for us it's it's a it's a very wide range of people that we work with and the the, the common factor they have is that they all want to start and run organizations and the name says it they have to be organized so that's what we do at Kantari so when they come to our campus they get you know they learn on work on policies they work on a proper registration a proper bookkeeping system um, and a proper bank account a website a logo a good name uh, communication skills they learn uh, how to uh, fundraise how to write reports so basically everything that is needed to start and run organizations and the good thing here is is that you know all of them need that and when they are here at Kantari we we run them through or everything in a very experiential way. So once they go back, they're not beginners anymore. And this is what we feel is, is if, if it's all linked to motivation and drive, right? And I think any one of us, if you, if you can find what it is that makes you happy getting up for the morning and give that sufficient thought, um, anything is possible, right? I think there's, we always focus on problems and we, we, a lot of people get stuck in problems and they stand in, in their own way of being part of the solution. 
And I think this is something that we 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 have to learn as 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 people. And the the, the cannot. I, I I wrote a quote once, and I said those people who say I cannot are mostly right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they, they <laughs> it's it's a very simple one, but it's it's you know if you keep saying it right, it's it's definitely not going to work. And I think we've we've seen people here without any pre-education, because that's the thing as well, right? It's what is, what is the education? So one, one other um, different approach that we have at Kantari, we don't have teachers and students. We have catalysts and participants, and they learn at eye, an eye level, right? A teacher, and see, unfortunately, some teachers, if a student excels, then, you know, they see, oh shit, there goes my job. <laughs> there's, a, there's a threat because this student is, you know, he's gonna take over my job. So they try to, you know, kind of keep the, keep the student down. So here it's not about competition. It's, it's about, okay, we want you to excel. That's why we call catalysts. You know, we want them to, ex, you know, to, to move forward in the best possible way. So the course is 12 months. Everybody that signs up are being selected. It's a tough selection process, gets a scholarship. And so there's a part that's online that's going on right now. And at the end of May, people come here for seven months on campus. And then there's another three months where they get uh, mentorship support from peers in their regions to start and run their organizations. So that's a little bit about uh, Kantari. I don't know if there's any comments or questions. Yes. Uh, yes. Please. <laughs> we can open the space for questions. Yeah, you. Oh, sorry. I, I see I should slow a pace. I'm sorry. <laughs> I see that. Thank, no one thank you, Paul. Yeah, I think Jasmine would love for you to slow your pace. She's doing an excellent work, but it's hard. So I'm super, super excited about hearing Cantari's story because um, it reminds me a little bit the story of Herramientas para el Buen Vivir, the organization, the university I, I'm coming from. And uh, what happened, and I'm curious of how much you work in, in such a collaborative and a, a appreciative view that you have to approach the organizational sphere. What we did, it was Herramientas para el Buen Vivir originally was uh, going to be five or different NGOs, no? each one with their legal registry, their uh, CTO one and that. And then we were like, why do we are going to pay five times and do five times the bureaucratic stuff? And we figure out a way to find a purpose because in Mexico, you have to have a, like, this is the purpose of the organization. And you have to keep it in that realm. So we found in the law, this space called a human development. And no one could describe in the government what exactly that means. So we took that. And then instead of having an uh, environmentalist NGO, uh, popular communication NGO, uh, <clears throat> alternative technology NGO, and a gender uh, topics NGO, we made one mm. and we said all of that is human development. And now we are also being an umbrella of other collectives that do not have, they are not at that stage of becoming an organization, but they mm. are organized and have opportunities to catch some funds. So we are an umbrella for them to catch it through us. So how much in That's Kantari good. do you do you look for like the interaction between like the learners, the people that are, come there to learn with you uh, for the further work in a collaborative way? It will be super nice to hear. So, yes, it's, um, see, the thing is at Kantari, what we try to do is we, we want, we have people coming here to India and they go back to their own communities. And what we are hoping for, and this is not yet realized as such as uh, uh, yet, is it's the Kantari NOC, so it's NOC, Kantari Network of Change and Knowledge. So we would, you know, it's, it's local groups of Kantaris, right, of these Chilis that are in different spaces and that where they collaborate more with each other. Um, I, I think a big issue is that a lot of people see each other as comp competitors and we shouldn't, right? We're in the end, if you zoom back, we're all on the same planet, right? So there's, there's no one, if somebody runs faster, then people will be left behind. So we have to make sure that, you know, we're on the same planet, come on. Yeah? So that we have to share. Now, um, we have been asked to start a second Kantari campus 
And we, we did explore this. We were in Rwanda, in Africa, because we have lots of people from Africa that apply to come here. But we, we went against, against that idea. Talk. <laughs> so we went against that idea because the, um, see, we focus on this place here. And we have a small group of people every year, it's between 20 and 25. And that's, that takes our full energy. And if you, we had, because we run Tibet, uh, simultaneously, so the Tibetan project, and we had a farm 250 kilometers away from our school, and then this is four and a half thousand kilometers away from where we are here. So we're running there all at the same time with 80, 85 people staff, and it it does you know hurt the quality that you can give to each of these groups. So we said we dedicate this to this place. But if anyone wants to start their own Kantari copy training center, right, they're very welcome. They can come here and you know have a course and then go back to their own country. And the, the big advantage of that would be that they could cater in the local language, right? That it would be in Spanish, for example, in Mexico, because we the, the limitation here is, of course, everybody has to speak English because English is the uh, because it's an international course. We we have the course in English. I hope that answers your question a little bit. And of course, we are in in like uh, conversations like this. We try to do this as much as possible as well to reach out to. Uh, so that you know we can at least share what we've been doing and we'd love to hear what other people are doing okay thank you paul okay awesome. anyone has questions comments ideas anything <laughs> there's a money question in the chat always is the money question Oh, wait, oh, it's Kantari. Okay, okay. Yeah, Kantari. Okay. Uh, Kantari is funded on scholarships. So we raise funds worldwide and anyone who is selected. So we have four entities. We have one in Switzerland, in Germany, in the Netherlands, in the US. Um, it sounds big, but it's not because it's, we have to raise our own funds for those entities. Um, and, but anyone who is, who is selected gets a scholarship. What we do, and see, this is the thing, right? If something is free, um, there's no value to it. That's what a lot of people feel. Right, uh, a lot of people think that freeware. Uh, if you look at the internet, Thunderbird, for example, is free, but it's not free. It's not the free from gratis, but it's the free from freedom. Right now, in our course, we do want people to put some skin in the game. See, if it's completely free, we had this in the beginning. We were paying for everything, and then somebody didn't feel like going on, and they had nothing to lose. Then you know they, they would drop everything. Right now, we what we do is we have a caution deposit system. It's a very simple system. So we want people to pay $750 upfront. So when they get the agreement, they have to pay $750 upfront. And some people say, well, but that's too much money. I cannot raise that. And we say, well, you are, it's a leadership training program. You want to start an organization. You have to raise way more than $750 in the future, right? So, and we teach you this kind of stuff. So if you can't do this now, then maybe you're not the right person. And you get the money back. So once you have paid that 750, so after the first part of the course, you get 250 back. After the end of the course on campus, you get another 250 back. And after 12 months, if you successfully complete, you get 250 back. So this is a little bit that, you know, if there's nothing to lose on the student side, right, then there's no value. I just see that I should talk a little bit more about the teaching method. Um, if, if I can, if everybody's okay with that, then I would like to do that. Is it okay? Okay. So the teaching method, what we do is we, um, <laughs> so we, we created a, a fictitious country in, and it's called Tanzalesia. So in the first act, it's a journey in five acts. We've got a curriculum that has set up a journey in five act. We completely developed it here in the house and it's all based on experience. See, there is an issue um, that nowadays you can get a, a swimming diploma uh, or becoming a swimming teacher from following online courses on swimming. <laughs> I don't know if you are in the water and you want to be taught by somebody that has a uh, diploma uh, of being a swimming teacher that uh, got his diploma online, <laughs> right? So it is, it is a little bit of, okay, learning from people that have experience. And we, we, we made lots of mistakes in the Tibet project in Braille Without Borders that we started. And uh, that's, that's a big issue. And so we said, you know what, we've made so many mistakes, so we know how not to do it. <laughs> so let's first share that. <laughs> So that's already half of your curriculum, right? To, to prevent people from making the same mistakes. And then we said, okay, let's look at people that had the experience. So we talked to lots of founders, 
lots of people that went through the same you know steps and then you come to a curriculum where it's about experiential learning so what we do in act one it's we take people into a fictitious country called Tanzania, and we took lots and lots of time to set the whole thing up it has a website with ministries with ngos with um there's a there's a prime minister there are political parties there are it's it's a true country and, and our campus becomes that country for several weeks in a row and everybody there's a national anthem and people are singing that and they they really feel like they're in Tanzania. so we have one lady from from um, nigeria she was calling home one day and her kids they, she didn't tell her that she was going to go for seven months <laughs> So the kids were every week asking, when you're coming back, when you're coming back. And then they said, where are you? And then she was saying, actually, she said, well, I'm in Tanzania. So that was working that she had the feeling she was in that country. And in that country, what we do is we, we let them experience true life cases. And that means they also get in a lot of trouble. And the, the goal is, see, if you learn by making mistakes, I think it's one of the best ways to learn, right? If you and, and you'll feel really embarrassed that you make bad mistakes, you most likely are not going to repeat that. <laughs> but it's, uh, if, if, you, if you just tell people you can't do that, you should not do this, you should not do this, you should not do this, just by saying it, that's not really experiencing it or feeling it, right? So that's what we try to do in this uh, fictitious country. Um, in the meantime, in, in the same time, in the first act, we, we have the so-called washing machine. And that's a very um, feared, <laughs> very frustrating period for our participants what we they come with a with a project right they have a project idea is they bring that to Kantari and that's where they that project idea is completely dismantled by asking very critical questions so we have hot seats and hot seats are feared <laughs> by the participants and hated in the beginning but at the end people love it because they are being on a stage they're being put on the stage and then there's a cold seaters they prepare the most critical questions you can imagine and what we want them to be prepared for is that when they go home and they start their organizations, they will get these questions. And if they then are not prepared to deal with that or to deal with the press, right, or deal with lawyers, yeah, or deal with any kind of issue that can come up. Once you have gone through that in practice and even if there's not a danger to it, though, that's the, you know, it, it feels so real, then, you know, the learning is, the, the, the level of learning is very, very high. So we, we get a lot of, um, uh, feedback from the participants once they're back home, they say, oh, this is like in Tanzania. So there's this definitely that somehow that is, is lingering. In the second act, we have its two parts. In the first part of the second act, they create their venture profiles. And the venture profiles is what every organization needs. They need, well, first of all, they need a what, your personal history, right? And a good write-up of that personal history. What, why are you the right person to lead that organization? Right? And of course, the people that we work with, if you've been threatened to be circumcised as an African woman in Kenya, and you went, you know, when you know, they, were threatened, she, they were threatening her to circumcise her when she was giving birth to the first baby. And when the water broke, she fled through the bush for 25 kilometers and delivered her baby healthy. This happened three times. That's a strong story to say like, hey, we should not circumcise our women. And so this woman went back and she saved several, about seven or 8,000 girls from not being circumcised, right? So that's, that's their personal story that has to be, you know, in a, in a very tangible form that has to be written down in a short version and a long version. Then they have to have the problem, the problem definition. What is it? What is the actual problem? And then what is the need? And then what is the solution? So there's, these are these building blocks that they need. And you need this for your website. You need this for a flyer. You need this for any story that you tell, right? It's, it's the what, the when, the why, and the how. It is, that all has to be in there, and the who, right? So, and this is what they get in that second part. And the second part of Act 2 is they're going to visit Kantari graduates in South of India and other NGOs to learn best practice. What is better to, to see people that went through the course and they already started the organization and they can ask them all the questions, what challenges did you have? What, you know, what went well? What didn't go well? How can we learn from you? Right, so that's best practice. And the third act, we changed this uh, last couple of years back because um, we, it's, it's called BASH. It's business and social change. A lot of organizations, they have some produce that they make, but they don't know, they're not very good in the marketing of it. And this is focused very much on business and social change. So it's, they're gonna work on a product 
And we started a, a new part, it's called Inani. Inani means value in the Zulu language. And we look at products that are seen as waste, but that can be turned into a feasible product to sell. So I'll give you one example. We have the beautiful lake here on the left side that just came out. And there's a lot of um, water hyacinths. And during the pandemic, we were cleaning them every day. And we found that they suck up water very well. Uh, so we started making diapers from them. So from the stocks, we made uh, diaper holders. And from the roots, we made these pads that you can put into a diaper. And the good thing is this, this is the only product that if it's full of shit, <laughs> it's more worth because we put it all, the whole thing goes into the biogas. <laughs> so that's, <laughs> and so this is one product that, and what we want the participants to do, and no matter, there's two elements to it in this project. No matter if you do something for disability or for peace building, we want two elements part of, of a project that's, well, peace is part of it, a conflict management, because without peace, no sustainability. And we have the um, Inani product, is that they come up with some product that can turn waste into some you know, income generating product. So that's BASH. And then Act 4 is the last part of the on-campus part. This is where people uh, go out in with their story to the public. So we have Kantari Talks. I don't know if you, any of you have seen this. It's the same like a TED you know, format. It's a 10-minute speech. However, see, when people can speak very well, at a TED talk, you can't really have questions because at the end, everybody's applauding, they are off stage. So we add in an element where there's an international panel and they're going to fry <laughs> the speaker right after they spoke. So they see if they're actually a subject matter expert or not. Right? So this is a, and, and that's also a good thing because that's where they are prepared by hot seats, right? So to give concise and good answers to questions. Um, and then they leave, then they go back home. And this is the end of December, or middle of December. And that's another three months where they have where they peer have support been. from Kantaris in their own uh, in their in own, their own uh, you know uh, communities you know, where they, where they're being helped to uh, to start and uh, you know register and and to get their organization started. Thank you, Paul. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. I feel it's kind of a good um, first part for the for this panel. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, because we had like an overview of a project that it's been running for a lot of time and you get to see the complexities of these kind of projects that are reclaiming the knowledge from their territories and empowering others. So really, really, I'm, I'm really, really happy to have been able to hear the story, Paul. And I'm going to, I think Manish is here, but I don't know. And also we have Manish, Dilip, and Dolly that they will share on their own experiences or questions around how to start their own micro cities. Um, Manish was here a minute ago, but we can start with Dilip, maybe. Or Dolly. Yes, hi everyone, I'm here. Uh, I just have to, I'm sorry, there's a little emergency that came up. Uh, so Dilip, why don't you share? Uh, and just, I need about five, seven minutes to resolve this whole thing. I'm sorry about that. Go ahead, Dilip, please. Uh, okay, hi, hi everyone. Um, uh, maybe I'll directly jump to what is ecoversity and the topic, how to start an ecoversity. Uh, I've been myself part of uh, different ecoversities at different stages uh, from Ladakh, Sekmal, Himalayan Institute of Alternatives to Adi Manav Academy that we have in Maharashtra and uh, also New Acropolis, which is a school of philosophy. Uh, so I've been different roles, different parts. Some I started, some I volunteered with and stuff like that. And uh, coming to the main question, what is an ecoversity? Uh, before coming to how to start an ecoversity is that uh, Currently, we there is a monoculture in way in the whole of education system. There is one stream of thought which everybody is expected to follow, and the whole idea of ecoversity is to have multi uh, stream of thoughts diversity. Because, like in a forest, uh, there needs to be different plants and animals and birds and reptiles and mammals and everything. You can't have only tigers and still a good forest. You need to have even a butterfly and a whatever. So the whole idea of ecoversity is how can we create a 
ecosystem where multiple different learning pedagogies, learning system, learning ways can thrive and survive and grow, even if it is not part of any big system. And even if the eco was is just five students or 50, it doesn't matter. Because a person who makes bamboo can have a bamboo eco -versity. Somebody who works with dolphin can have a dolphin eco -versity. And somebody who works in a forest can have a forest eco -versity. So like in the past, there were multiple educational systems which were more contextual to the place, more localized and more hands-on. And that is what we need to reclaim because the whole wave of monoculture is driven by capitalist consumers narrative. And it is actually anti-ecology, anti-society and anti-spirituality. But yes, it is pro-capitalism. And that is what we want to reclaim as part of education system where we can let multiple ideas thrive, survive and grow. And that is what ecoversity is all about. And through different programs like the Germinator program that we have, uh, we are trying to support uh, support such different initiatives, such different projects, so that we can have more ecoversities all over the world, and then ecoversities can collaborate. So it's not necessary that each ecoversity has to have everything itself and be the best in the world. No, if I am running a forest ecoversity and say Dolly is running a hip hop ecoversity, we both collaborate. The tribals come and learn hip hop, and hip hop comes to the forest and do plantation. And when such collaborations happen, there is a lot more learning, a lot more exchange of ideas. And uh, then we are not alone. We are a big ecosystem, which is creating a better alternative against the main system. Uh, so that's what ecoversity is. Uh, uh, maybe how to start will come maybe a, a minute later once Manish Bhai does it or before Manish Bhai comes, maybe Dolly can share about her, <clears throat> her project. Dolly. <laughs> Also, Dilip, can you speak a bit slower? Also, Dolly, remember that we have a translation and Jasmine is doing the best she can. <laughs> so please take a breath. Also, and thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Dolly. Hello. Namaste to everybody. Um, uh, so we had a very good chat with uh, Manish Bhai last month where it was an India gathering called as the Learning Societies, <clears throat> uh, Learning Unconference. Societies Unconference, LSUC is how we call it. And we were also trying to understand uh, from him his version of Ecoversity, <clears throat> which was very simple and it resonated so well with us uh, and everybody who attended the Unconference. Uh, so Ecoversity is, eco means coming home, coming home to where you feel lively, to a place where you feel that you are uh, that you are living your dream and you are uh, feeling very connected not only with yourself with the environment and with people around uh, including your feelings your emotions and your thoughts and how can we get into the space of reimagining education uh, by spreading awareness or knowing ourselves of what we like to do or what we want to do. Uh, and I would like to reiterate what Paul uh, mentioned in his talk, in his sharing about, you know, the purpose of life. Uh, do we know what we want? Do we know what will make us happy? And do we really know how much time we want to give? Uh, so I think everything just boils down to knowing ourselves better. And in turn, we can help others uh, and our fellow uh, friends, our extended family or ecoversities um, to help them achieve of what each one of us has been dreaming. So it's a similar uh, thought process in the work that we do, uh, which is uh, running a hip hop school in the ghettos of Mumbai, where, uh, the, where the youth doesn't like going to the school, um, which we thought shouldn't stop them from reimagining what they what they what they like what they are passionate about <clears throat> so we started a center which focuses on helping them learn educate themselves about themselves about their feelings <clears throat> about their passion through an art form um, so for others it might not be a university or because there is no curriculum here there are no grades or marks um, but I think that is why we all are here together 
uh, reimagining, reimagining our life uh, and looking very closely to the purpose uh, of why we are here. Um, so this, according to us, is you know ecoversity. Um, and Manish Bhai actually helped us frame a few steps on how each one of us would come up with our own ecoversity. And it ranges. It ranges from uh, youth leadership programs to spirituality uh, to forest diversity. Uh, then it's got to do with frisbee. Um, and there are different, you know, different avenues, which uh, if we just look at ourselves, there's this new one that, you know, we all uh, have just started in India uh, through Manish Bhai. It's called the Death, Death University. And it is so amazing when it came out. We felt so happy because we all felt the connection. And this is something which is so real. And we experience it. We see it and we feel sad when somebody leaves. But what is the purpose of that? What, what emotions do people go through? Do we actually learn about? It? Because we most of our time is spent on concentrating, focusing, learning about the system, learning about different processes. But these are these are real things. We, and it's a and it's a hard one. It's a tough topic. You know, when I just throw it out here and talk about it, I think. It's very unfair because there's so much in it. There's so much depth in it and there's so much acceptance that has to come in. Uh, and I think um, related to this perfect timing where I really want to take a break because we see Manish Bhai on the screen while we're talking about Death University. And I would like to pass on uh, to Raj. <laughs> to bait into him because he's the torch bearer for us. Um, Manish Bhai, over to you. You, you just spoke about ecoversity and LSUC in India, and also your um, gathering where you were sharing about the different steps. You are on mute, Baya. Hello, hello. Sorry, everyone. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. Um, I was just got off of a 16-hour flight. Thank you so much, and Dilip and Dolly for sharing. I think his connection is not very well. There are a few um, sites oh. we created. A, <laughs> we created a startup for which is the worst website, and we will map with as steps how you can start your own city today. Um, so that you can rather than our own hyper-rational minds um, and our fears and anxieties. So um, a couple of learnings I would just say from uh, the year, the year, years is one is that um, naming, naming the ecoversity is, is a very sacred and important process. And I think the naming of it uh, draws in a lot of energies and, um, and uh, connections, people to feel connected to something that is, uh, very powerful and meaningful. Um, so I think, you know, the name, when you think about it is very important. And the second thing is the stories behind it. So the stories, I would say like for our, for Swaraj University, we talk about um, the story being 5,000 years old. So our first chancellor was a person from the Mahabharat 5,000 years ago. And that been very critical because people are able to not think of this as some new, you know, another new thing from the West or in India, they think that this is connected to our roots, our own stories, our own uh, cultures. And um, and there's a space, obviously, for within a healthy uh, discourse to keep interpreting and, and those stories and going deeper into them. Um, so the story of that. And the second story is why personally I'm involved in this. Um, that's the other level. So what's your own skin in the game? What's your purpose? For creating this ecoversity, it matters a lot to people when you tell the story. So I think that's the second thing I would offer. And um, in terms of storytelling, the second, the third thing is really, as I said, prototyping, uh, starting something like today, put out a little talk, put out a little event, tell people, start talking to people, test it out if it resonates, and keep iterating it, keep developing it. It'll guide you, um, and um, 
you know, make a little website for it. Um, we just built one for what we call for farm versities. And that has been, again, a very good way to attract a lot of energy and uh, see if it's making sense to people. So we have to keep checking if it's making sense to us and to people around us and even people who don't agree with us. Is it making any sense? So I would urge you, you know, make a flyer, make a video around it. There's a lot of little things, host a little event. And the, the fourth thing I would just say is like we have built this whole thing with very few financial resources. So we call it the gift culture that really is building out of, out of uh, building a web or field of trust and uh, inspiration and care. And um, you know, like today, I don't have, I never had any, we never had any funds to buy a campus or, uh, but we have today more than 20 campuses, people, friends who have campuses that are very inspired about the idea. And this new year campus time you want to do an event, uh, and then there's like also any spaces like cafes or um, farms that people have, or you know uh, even parks. I know we have a friend in Leeds University on Bridge in Fava. Um, so many different um, ways we can think, and if we get out of this whole model that we have to own it and we have to like ownership and financial ownership. There's a lot of ways for gift to flow. Even like we have more than a thousand and people who would charge a lot to do an event, they actually feel inspired by the idea of Swaraj University and they contribute their time, their energy uh, as a kind of, you know, in this sort of co-creation that they, once again, the story is powerful enough that it invites them to uh, feel like, yes, we want to build something different. The world needs something different. We want to be part of co-building that together. So the gift culture, um, and it's it's not only benefiting in terms of creating an ecoversity, it's a it's also the other case. As we create more of the gift culture, it creates a lot more uh, possibilities for others around us, for people who come and learn our in our spaces, um, and for regenerating real wealth um, in our communities. So I think um, those are a few things which I would offer. Um, so, you know, like hopefully uh, we can, uh, we keep running little workshops about how to start your own ecoversity. So we'd invite you to participate in that. And there's a startup kit, as I said, online. And um, uh, then you can download that for as a gift. And um, you can write to us also if you have specific questions uh, for your ecoversities. Sorry, I'm talking too fast. I thought there's a a little bit of a time thing but um so thank you everyone yeah and i really look forward to to hearing more about your projects and supporting you we want part of what ecoversity does is want to mentor thousands and thousands of ecoversities around the world which are very place-based contextual projects rather than trying to be kind of universal corporatized models but really communities can lead these these new models. So, and, and it brings out all kinds of different knowledge systems, which are not really uh, necessarily um, fitting into the mainstream. So thank you everyone. Uh, just one more thing I want to add in continuation of Manish Bhai said is, is uh, over next uh, three months we are having one session every uh, last Friday at 7 p.m. on how to start an ecoversity. This is a chain of four sessions uh, where we'll talk about uh, different steps and preparations needed to start an ecoversity. So, in, in case any of you are interested in joining those mentoring calls, uh, you are more than welcome. We'll share the details about this uh, on the chat. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. I'm about to turn on my camera. So I don't know if someone has questions um, or has comments. Um,
So maybe if not, we have still 10 minutes and I want to do like a round of breakout rooms to share a bit. What, what is the time and um, time zone again for session? Okay, this is for Dilip. Okay, so I want to invite you all to take a deep breath. Now we'll take a deep breath. And embracing all of this energy that is moving around us. We have people from all over the world in this room sharing so many stories. These energies that people that carry this work, this incredible work, we've been listening to some words. Try to embrace the words. Try to feel how much... Whatever it is in you that comes out. There is so much beauty all over the world when we are reimagining education, when we are reclaiming knowledge, when we are listening to the earth, the sky, the sun, the moon, our grandparents, our parents, children. There is so, so much beauty that I feel this, sharing all of these stories recharges in us. So I hope you can feel it in you. You can receive it. And I want to invite you to a question. So this is kind of the first question. Keep your eyes closed if you feel comfortable. I'll, I'll tell you the question. What could be an, an ecoversity that, that you dream of? If you have to put now an intention, a name, an idea, how that looks like, what, how, what is the name of that? Think of a name. Think of something that it's nurturing your path, that it's nurturing your life. Put a name on it. Now, I'm going to invite you to open your eyes. And we'll do a short run of breakout rooms to share your dream, to share the name, to share this intention, to put it out. We've come to a place where when we put intentions in the middle, we have this goddess of the ecoversities that it's kind of guiding us in many, many ways. And it's a bit of magical. It's a putting a spell when we put our intentions on the middle. So I want to invite you to share this on breakout, on breakout rooms. I'll make... You'll be on breakout rooms of two or three where you'll share this dream. And we'll, got, we'll have like six minutes. I'm sorry for the time. <laughs> um, but I hope you, each of you take like two minutes and share it. Think of it on a spell, like put on a spell on the middle and just relax and try to to trust in whatever happens from this. So I'll create the groups. Um, just, we have six names. Okay. Everyone's coming back. So as I said, dream, 
put a chair that are like a spell for our lives. So let's hold them like that. Let's wait for everyone to come back. No more minutes. So thank you, thank you everyone. I hope you got a chance to share beautiful dreams, to share your deepest, deepest intention. I know the time is super short, but I trust that whatever we are together, we light up something so beautiful in ourselves. So whatever it came out is something there. Like, like I, I used to say that, like, what if we dream of being a unicorn? Like sounds some that might not be able but if we want to be unicorns we might change our hair or just run that path what what will happen there and see like what happens like paul shared this idea of this child that wanted to be a taxi driver and then walk in that dream he find out that mm, maybe another one <laughs> so let's walk our dreams and let's work our ecoversities ideas and let's see what comes out. There is a lot of information on the network also on ecoversities.org. You can check there. Uh, we are around for information. Um, partly if you want anything, you can write to the Reimagine Education, Gmail. I can also put my information, also Paul. Dilly, Dolly can put their in their mails. Maybe if you need to talk to someone, we are around. Um, yeah, so I'm really grateful for you all to be here and have a beautiful rest of the conference. And thank you so much for everything. Thank you so much, everybody. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye. -bye.